Do you often work with tabular data and find it tricky to identify trends and spot the outliers? If so, then the Seaborn heat map may just be for you. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the Seaborn heat map. But first, what are heat maps? Essentially, heat maps are just paint by numbers. We take a colour and then assign it to a value within the table, and this can help us understand our data better. And with that, we can understand where we've got our maximum and minimum values, as well as where we've got po possible extreme values, outliers, and also we can identify patterns within the data. In today's video, we're going to see how we can use the heat map for two applications. The first is looking at temperature data over a period of time, and the second is to look at correlation values between variables. So let's go over to our Jupyter notebook and see how we can apply a Seaborn heat map to our data. So the first example we are going to look at is using temperature data from the Rothera station in the Antarctic Peninsula. So heat maps are a great tool for visualising this type of data as we can easily spot trends over long periods of time. First thing that we need to do is import the libraries that we're going to be working with. In this case we're going to be using pandas which is imported as PD, Seaborn which is imported as SNS and we will also be calling upon matplotlib.pyplot which is imported as PLT. We can then import the data that we're going to be using by using pd.read underscore csv. Now I have a few extra arguments in here so that the uh, missing values, which are represented by a hyphen, are converted to nans. I'm also setting the, the months column as the index for the data frame. So if we run that and then call upon the data frame, we can see that we've got the years along the columns and the months along each of the rows. And within that we have the temperature values. So we can easily convert this to a heat map using Seaborn, and that is done by calling upon sns.heatmap and then passing in the data frame. So once we run this, we get back a heat map which shows how the temperature varies over the years for each month. So let's make a few changes to this heat map. First, we need to increase the figure size so that we can represent every year along the x-axis. And we can do that by calling upon matplotlib. So first, we need to call upon plt.figure and then we pass in the argument fig size and we set that to a value. So in this case I'm going to set that to 15 inches by 8. And then we call upon our heat map again, sns.heatmap and then pass in our data frame and when we call upon this we now have a much larger figure and we can see each of the individual years within this data set. At the moment the colours don't really make sense. So we have the colder months represented by really dark purples and almost black, whereas the warmer months are represented by these light, very light colours. So let's change this colour map over to something that's more representative of colour changes. And we can do this by calling upon the cmap argument. And then we pass in cool, warm and run it. So now we can see the colder temperatures represented in blue and then the warmer temperatures represented in red. And this provides a much nicer visualisation to understand the temperature range. We can see that the temperature during the southern hemisphere's winter months, June through September, has gradually warmed through the years and reduced in span. So at the start here, we had the winter months going from about June to October, which was relatively cold. And then if we move over to 2020 and 2021, we can see that that has reduced almost to a single month where temperatures are below zero. <laughs> So let's move on to the next way that we can use heat maps and we can use them to visualise correlations between the variables within the data set. So here I've got a well logged data set and I'm going to select certain curves from this data set. So caliper, bulk density, gamma ray, neutron porosity, photoelectric factor and acoustic compressional. So these are commonly acquired curves within the well logging environment and we often want to see how they correlate with each other. So if I run this and then view the well data, we can see that we've got our individual values for each of the logging curves. We don't have depth, as I'm not really interested in depth for this particular example. As I say, we're just looking at the relationship between the variables. So before we do that, we need to call upon welldata.core to calculate the correlation values between each of the variables. And we'll assign that to a variable called core. If we want to view that, we can call upon the variable and we can see the correlation values between each of the, the curves. So at the moment, we can see that we've got caliper, row B, etc. along the, the column headers and we've also got along the row headers. And along the diagonal, we've got one, which is where we're comparing the variable with itself. And this is obviously going to be one as it's going to be exactly the same. 
And then we have the other values. However, this is where heat maps can help understand our data by visualizing it in a better way. So at the moment, we're just looking at numeric values, which is not as easy to visualize and understand. So if I call upon sns.heatmap and pass in our core variable, our data frame here where we've got the correlations, we get back this figure here with multicolored patches. Now it's not very clear to see what's actually happening, so we need to make some visual adjustments to our figure. And the first one that we can do is change the colors. So if I take our heat map here, and we again call upon the cmap argument, assign that to rd, BU, which means red to blue, and then we get back a figure which looks a little bit better as we've got a divergent color scheme instead of a sequential one here. So here we've got values up at one, which are indicated by blue, which indicate that we've got a strong positive correlation between the variables, and negative correlations are represented by a deep red. So at the moment we're going from a, a value of one down to negative 0.8 or thereabouts. But what happens if we want to just make that a little bit neater so that we're going from positive one to negative one? And then the colors will be assigned accordingly. So if I do Vmin is equal to negative one and Vmax is equal to one, we now have the full range of the data. And we can also assist the, the visualization of this by using an annotation. If I type in anot, which is short for annotations, is equal to true, and we run that, we now have the numeric values. So here we have our data frame where we can see those, those values, but now we've got some added color so we can see where our features are going to correlate with each other. So we've got row B, strongly negatively correlated with DTC, and it is also strongly negatively correlated with N5, which is what we would expect. And we also have strong positive correlations with N5 and caliper, as caliper increases, then we're going to expect the neutron porosity or the N5 curve to also increase as the tool is reading more of the borehole fluid. We can also style the annotations very easily and we do that using anot underscore kws which is short for annotation keywords and with this we pass in a dictionary and we will pass in the font size so if we want to change the size of these values within this we then pass in the font size key and then we set the value and we'll set this to say 11, which is 11 points. And then we also want to set the font weight. So we maybe want to set this to bold and we can do that simply by repeating what we've just done. And there we have the value. So it just makes it a little bit more easy to read the numbers. So you may notice that each of these entries or en these cells within the heat map are slightly squashed vertically. We can make these true squares by simply passing in another argument, which is called square, and then we set that as equal to true. So now each cell is a proper square. And there we have it. We've seen how to create a simple heat map very easily with the Seaborn library. If you've enjoyed today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up down below. And if you want to see more content from this channel, be sure to click on that subscribe button and ding that notification bell. So thanks for watching. Until next time, bye for now.